you'd think an idea worth spending the rest of your life chasing would occur to you in a more profound place than a camel bus stop. Not so with Jake Lang. He was a strange, invisible boy who walked from an island of trees in a stream of early morning traffic. A cloud of crows that had been feasting on a fallen possum rose angrily where he stepped. Every car that hit him found no bruised flesh nor broken bones. He was little more than a ghost, face blurred and clothes dark and indistinct. His glass feet stepped up from the road to the pavement on my side of the street, but no one else at the bus stop saw. They were all adults. The boy kept walking past the adults and the crows. He sat down on the cold bench next to me. There was no way I could talk to him, not until I was out of earshot of everyone. He seemed to understand and said nothing, just smiled. I caught the next bus and took the seat at the very front where no one could disturb us. From the glass shield that separated the front seat from the doors, I could see the invisible boy perched in the bag rack behind me. He didn't talk, he just watched me as I went about my day at school, puzzled by my efforts to blend in with the girls. He was still there when I got home, lounging in my red chair as I tried to do my homework. There was something wild about him. He had the eyes of someone who knew a terrible secret. Red crosses peppered my homework as I marked it out of the back of the textbook. I turned the sheet over and scribbled until grey graphite drowned the crimson ink. I looked over to the boys I drew. Colour flushed his cheeks, messy and crude, just like my drawing. His hair, where previously dark, had paled to a bluish white. He covered a striped shirt with baggy overalls that trailed around his pale feet. He rolled the ends up, and thick denim gave way to thin leggings woven from the night sky itself. I decided that was where he had come from. He was an alien, unknown to anyone else and certainly unknown to me. Some unknown, in fact, but I didn't even realise he was me. Over the following months, I wrote more about that strange boy from the stars. Soon he had a name and a history. I took him with me to guides, where he sat under a table to hide from the girls as I showed him to my best friend, who had later come to consider my brother. Soon, he began to see Jake too, and years later, his own Jake appeared. We were birds of a feather. After that, Jake's face and mine started to blend together. In my dreams, I took his name for my own. But every time I woke up and found I wasn't in his body anymore, I despaired. He'd look at me with such pity that I couldn't stand it. I locked him back inside my heart and barred the windows and red on my skin. He tried to escape almost daily, whispering through the bars of his prison and writing his protests on its walls. More bars crisscrossed the old ones, and heavier bars barricaded the door firmly shut. Still, he wouldn't stop. He told me I couldn't run away from this anymore. I told him to get stuck. I ran away from the school's conscripted dance competition, terrified that the costume would reveal Jake's prison. I was found by my aunt, but never told her why. I had no answers that would mean anything to an adult. It was only when my mother's friend explained about his own transition that I found my answer. I was both elated and afraid that no one would ever take me seriously, or worse, accuse me of attention seeking or bandwagon jumping. Fear then quickly overtook Euphoria, and I stuffed Jake back in his cell. I threatened him with steel and bound him behind familiar rusted iron and damp red rope. I covered his mouth in duct tape and at last he was silent. I left him at the side of the road, glassy as the day he first appeared. It didn't last for long. At every mention of my old name and old pronouns, Jake would be there. He'd look on in silence, tears rolling down his glassy cheeks. At every demand to be more ladylike, he'd be there, his face growing dark and rippled with anger. At every counselling session, he'd be standing next to the counsellor, wordlessly encouraging me to say something, anything. I ignored him. I thought I could ignore him forever. That is, until the last term of ninth grade. As the chilling winter winds turned to warm spring sunshine over the school, Jake appeared again. He was flushed with colour, as he always was whenever my mind turned to the public school down the road. There, he and I could be free, but the year was coming to a swift end, and if we were going to transfer in the new year, we had to apply soon. Behind the library's glass doors, Jake stood, solid as a human being. He had a firm look set on his face, and pointed to the duct tape still covering his mouth. It was time we talked again. It only took one whispered conversation down at the very back of the library to convince me something had to be done. Then it was time to talk to my mother. 
He was even more understanding of the boy than I'd hoped, but she too conceded that it was probably too late to transfer to schools next year, given such short notice. It was as if a fuse had blown. I was plunged into darkness. Every time I walked past Marble Road, I wondered what it would feel like to be hit. I could see myself being thrown up in the air by the never-ending river of cars, disappearing among their metal bodies, kicking to a pulp by tires. But it was close to an ambulance station, so there was a chance I'd survive. I kept walking, and so did Jake. It didn't matter how many times I told him to leave me alone, he just kept following. The only end I could see was the map carved into my arm, but even then it was too dark in the tunnel to see it clearly. I lit a candle and wished my end would be swift. Instead, the candle's glass exploded in a shower of molten red wax and fire. It covered my hands and seared my skin. Faces flashed before my eyes, my parents, my aunts, my brothers, even those of my siblings. It reminded me of what I'd lose if I died in that tunnel. So I searched for a door. I needed no candle, no map, only to trust that Jake would lead me back. Jake became my conscience, reminding me of our pact forged in that tunnel. I promised him I'd keep walking, so long as he stayed a few steps behind. Whenever I wanted to follow the map or add another street to it, he'd run up and remind me it would break my brother's heart. Because my brother is my soulmate, that simple reminder was enough to turn the train's headlamp into a tunnel's end. Both he and Jake stayed through by my side through an emotionally abusive relationship and the slow torture of seeing all my trans friends getting binders and teeth. As I left high school for the freedom of the university, I found I no longer needed Jake to be my conscience. Our lives had moved on and our paths diverged, but I'd never want to lie without that strange, invisible boy.